2008 hype video from Southern Miss football introducing our new head coach Larry Fedora was full of intensity and passion and I'm so fired up to have him as my guest today. Welcome to the latest edition of Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime with me Marshan Kenny and I want to talk a little Southern Miss athletics right now especially Southern Miss baseball. They're on their fourth straight SBC series win and they just swept James Madison over the weekend so this second half of the season is looking Pretty hot over there at Pete Taylor Park, so let's see what happens as we head to regional time in the postseason. Well, I love the fan comments for this show, as you all know that by now, and that comes in this next segment that we call Four and Out. Well, this week on Twitter, I asked the Southern Miss Nation if you could recreate one Southern Miss athletics team from the past, which one would it be and why? I had a lot of good Comments come in, but I can only get to four because that's the name of the segment, four and out. First up, Sports and Food, Twitter handle at SportsFood1135. They say the 1990-91 men's basketball team, that team could have been Sweet 16 without a key injury. Yeah, that was a great hoop year right there. Next up, USM Voice comes with something I personally like a lot for obvious reasons. They say the 1997 Liberty Bowl champion, and Conference USA Championship football team. And yeah, I know a little bit about that. So I appreciate all the love, USM Voice right there. Next up, John Wickman, Twitter handle at jwick44, says the 1990 baseball team, just because that was when I was in school and they were building for what we have now. And yeah, that was the first NCAA regional team for Southern Miss baseball. Hill Denson working his magic back then. And finally, Travis Sy says the 2003 Southern Miss football team when they beat undefeated number nine TCU at the Rock. And that's my personal favorite home football game in Southern Miss history. Thanks for all the comments, everybody. Please keep them coming in. Well, this show is big with interviews, as you know, and this next one I am so fired up about. It comes from a man who led Southern Miss to one of its greatest seasons in Southern Miss football history back in 2011. With all that said, I'm bringing you today the one and only Larry Fedora. Well, today's guest is considered one of the best football coaches in the history of Southern Miss. His 2011 Southern Miss team is easily considered one of the best uh, out there. So today's guest, with all that said, is former Southern Miss head football coach Larry Fedora. And Coach Fedora, how you doing? I'm doing great. I mean, uh, loving life. Heck yeah, man. And you should be. You had a heck of a career. I wanted to talk to you about something. Uh, you came in with this new style at Southern Miss in 08, uh, and they made this commercial for you. I mean, it was kind of black and white. It was gritty. It was in your face. It was aggressive. Do you remember that video and that marketing campaign? Oh, yeah, yeah. How could you not remember that? <laughs> right. you know, first of all, they, they hired a professional TV crew to come in and do that, a production crew. And uh it was take after take after take, you know, and they were like, well, you're, you're a little bit too aggressive, you know? And I'm like, well, that, that's just the way I am, you know, that's the way I coach. And, uh, but it was, it was cool. I think the players that were involved, I mean, we had a lot of fun with it. Oh, heck yeah, man. I remember it caught a lot of eyes. A lot of people started talking about Southern Miss football pretty fast, man. So, but your football career, it all had to start somewhere. Austin College, you're a wide receiver, two-time All-American and an academic All-American, and, and you guys won the 81 uh, NIA National Championship. So talk a little bit about your playing days at Austin College. Well, that that uh, National Championship was my freshman year, and I was on the team. I, I, I couldn't say that I contributed that much at all, but uh, but uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a small school. It would be Division Three now. It was NAIA back then, and, and uh, 
you know, it's just a bunch of guys that uh, really wanted to play ball, you know, that loved every aspect of it. And uh, we had some good teams and won a bunch of games and had a lot of fun. And, and actually we were, we were the whole reason I went there is they were throwing the ball around back then. And, and uh, not many people were doing it back then, still doing it out of two back, but a three wide uh, receiver set. And so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun doing those things. Yeah, it was fun. And so, uh, that just, for me, I, I knew I wanted to coach, and I knew uh, started when I was a freshman in high school that I knew I wanted to be a football coach. And uh, so that just kind of reiterated it and, you know, just kind of went from there. Oh, heck yeah, and I can tell you wanted to be in coaching from some old quotes I saw from you. Head coach there, Larry Kramer at Austin at that time, he's a big impact in you wanting to be a coach. So talk about the relationship you had with him and, and your coaching philosophies. Yeah, well, Larry, Larry Kramer was a uh, an All-American tackle at Nebraska. He was a consensus All-American back uh, the same year as Butkus and uh, Gale Sayers. And he was, uh, and believe me, an old school, you know, kick you in the ass. I mean, get after you, football coach. I mean, he he might uh, headbutt you and have blood running down his uh, <laughs> his forehead. And uh, my freshman year, I was scared to death of him, you know. But, uh, you know, everybody on the team respected the heck out of him. He called the offense and the defense. I mean, he called both sides of the ball. He coached it all. I mean, he was he was phenomenal. Went on to Emporia State and won a national championship there, uh, you know, and then went uh, finished up at K-State with uh, Coach Snyder. Uh, Coach Snyder had actually been on his staff at Austin College uh, earlier in his career. And so it was, uh, he kind of went uh, full circle there. But yeah, he had a tremendous impact on my life. And I think just about every guy that was on that football team. Oh, heck yeah, man. And, uh, you know, you had a couple coaching stops after Austin, but had a big break in 91 at Baylor, uh, became multi-position coach there on the offensive side of the ball, uh, went there for six years. And uh, you've got this great offensive mind, man, coming into college football. What, were your, what was your time at Baylor like there back from 91 to 96? Yeah, so I go there. Uh, the legendary Grant Taft was the head coach at that time. And, and uh, we went as a GA. Uh, my wife and I, and, and we found out, you know, about two months before we were going that we were pregnant with our first child. And so that, it made it tough. You know, we were making $400 a month and, uh, you know, uh, with a, a wife and child. And uh, so my wife did a lot of, a lot of extra jobs to, to get us through that. But we did that for a couple of years and then Coach Taft retired and Chuck Reedy got the head coaching job. And, uh, he hired all his coaches and didn't have any money left. And there was one spot left. And so he hired me and uh, I was actually making less money than I was as a high school coach in the uh, previous five years. So, but uh, it was an unbelievable experience. I mean, it really was, it was my first opportunity to, to coach college ball and, and Chuck gave me that opportunity and, and uh, it was tremendous. I mean, the, the, uh, he was a great recruiter, and I learned a lot about recruiting from him and, and organization. And, and uh, Jack Crow was the offensive coordinator uh, on his staff, and I worked under Jack. And, and uh, Jack was probably the toughest coach that I ever worked for, I mean, as far as uh, what he expected from you. But I probably learned more ball from him than anybody I ever learned from. So it was, uh, it was just a great experience, especially for your first uh, opportunity. Oh, heck yeah, man. It sounded like a great run there at Baylor. And uh, something – kind of interesting happens uh, in the terms of synergy, man. You got this great offensive mind, you know, you got all these ideas. And your next stop, you wind up at Air Force, which is known for the triple option. You know, uh, we're, we're going to ground it out. <laughs> so how did your philosophy work at Air Force or try to get it installed as a coach with head coach Fisher DeBerry there at the time? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I was lucky. I mean, you had the legendary uh, Fisher DeBerry. So Absolutely. you know, I had Grant Taft, Chuck Reedy, and, and Fisher DeBerry, the first three head coaches I was around at the college level. And so I was blessed. I mean, I I, I was like a sponge learning everything I could from those guys. And, and so I was the uh, receiver coach, you know, and we traveled three receivers, you know, to gain, sometimes four, you know, <laughs> sometimes four if I was really lucky. And – uh we really didn't keep track of catches as much as we kept track of knockdowns, you know? And so we had goals for knockdowns and how many times could you put a guy on the ground, you know? So, uh, but don't, man, what a, what an unbelievable experience. First of all, you know, they're, they're uh, the cream of the crop uh, education wise. These guys are just, I mean, brilliant, you know, and uh, not all of them were great players, you know, or great athletes, but they, they had great heart and they played extremely hard and, we won 23 games in those two years right there. And, uh, but I will tell you this about Fisher 
in the spring, he would send you out and he wanted you to go visit other colleges to get, pick up ideas to bring them back to, you know, and so where did I go? I go to Tulane where Rich Rodriguez was when he was going. He was the only, only school in the country going no huddle at that time, which is something that I wanted to do and dreamed about doing. And uh, so I came back from uh, Tulane and, and, I, and I presented to Coach DeBerry, you know, hey, we need to throw it more. We need to do this and we need to do that. And I remember him saying, Larry, we are throwing it. We're just throwing it backwards, you know, when we, when we pitch it. <laughs> the pitch. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, but golly, what, a, what an unbelievable head coach he was and a great motivator. And uh, I learned a, a lot about being a head coach from him. No, oh, heck yeah. And you speak hard whenever you see military academies play, especially the Air Force, man, you know, they're going to give it 110 percent every single game and the respect is huge. So uh, you guys do really well right there in 98, finish number 10, 12 and one, uh, win the WAC and win the Oahu Bowl. So, I mean, a great run there and you're starting to get recognized, man. And and your next stop, uh, kind of you get to do your own thing in a way, man. Offensive coordinator at Middle Tennessee in 99. So how did it feel finally? All right, I got all these ideas. I can control things. <laughs> well, you know, so so Andy McCollum was on our staff at, uh, at uh, Baylor. And he got the head job at uh, Middle Tennessee State. Middle Tennessee State was a 1AA program that was making the jump to 1A. And, you know, he, he asked me to be his offensive coordinator. And I remember Coach DeBerry was like, you know, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go there. They're going 1A. This is, you know, it's going to, it's not going to be good for your career. But I was so comfortable at, at Air Force and, and it was such a great situation. I was scared. I was, I was like, I'm not sure I was supposed to be that comfortable that, that early in my career. And so uh, I decided, you know, hey, I want to go see if I can do this on my own. And uh, so I, I made that jump to Middle Tennessee. And I remember Andy going, okay, so what are you going to do offensively? I said, well, we're either going to run the triple option or we're going to spread it out, go no huddle, and we're going to throw it all over the house, you know. And so uh, West Counts was our quarterback, and, uh, you know, you could you could time him with a calendar, so the triple option was out. And so we decided to go no huddle. And, and uh, again, when the only other team in the country was Tulane doing it at the time. And we just uh, we had a lot of success with it, and it kind of took off from there. God, talk about two ends of the planet with offense. We're going to choose either the triple option. Yeah. Or we're going to spread it out. There's no middle ground, Coach, no middle ground. <laughs> well, no, you would be surprised. It was triple option concepts within the plays. I mean, if you think about it, oh, okay. RPOs okay. RPOs are nothing but triple option. Okay. I mean, the quarterback's either handing it off, he's keeping it himself, or he's throwing it. I mean, that's that's triple option football. It's just a different different way of getting there. Yeah, different formations. I think of that triple option with the wings, with Air Force. But yeah. You're, you're an offensive mind. You know a million ways to do the triple option, Coach. Well, and it was always about – it was, you know, tempo was the biggest thing for me was was changing the tempo of the game and keeping those defensive guys off balance where they never could get comfortable, you know. And and that defensive coordinator was having to make those calls as fast, and, and, and that was unusual for them. Back then, I mean, we were lining up against people and snapping the ball, and they were still in a huddle with the Mike linebacker making the call with his back to the offense. And we were snapping it and going. You know, so it was it was crazy when this all first started. Oh, heck yeah. That no huddle high tempo, that causes defensive coordinators nightmares, man, and defensive players. So you're one of the early instigators of that and doing well. Your last year at Middle Tennessee, you have the number five offense in America in total offense, man. So you're getting a name for yourself. Your name's getting so big. Florida catches the uh, name of Coach Larry Fedora, man, and you go there for three years as the offensive coordinator. Man, how was that stepping up from there and getting this big SEC job? Well, you go to, you, you know, obviously the University of Florida is a tremendous school with great history. And Ron Zook had gotten the job. And so he called and asked if I would be willing to come. And so we went there and it was uh, an a, a, another great experience. You had great athletes. And, uh, you know, I know the, uh, the last year we were there, we had the number one offense in the SEC. And we were doing some things that had never been done. I mean, you know, in that league, there was there was no tempo. You know, I mean, I remember when we played, uh, you know, Saban at LSU when we were at Middle Tennessee, and, and we gave them problems. I mean, we didn't beat them; we weren't even close to beating them. But we went up and down the field against his great defense, and so uh, I knew it would work. I knew it would work at that level, and so we had a lot of fun with it there at Ford, also. Yeah, you had a great three-year run, and like I said, your name is just starting to get. Huge in the offensive world is this great mind. And Oklahoma State, 
decides, man, we're going to we're going to really snatch him up and make you the highest paid offensive coordinator in America. So uh, right after Florida, you go to Oklahoma State and this is right prior to Southern Miss. Talk about that run at Oklahoma State where you're really being recognized for this great offensive mind. Well, Mike Gundy got the job and Mike Gundy was actually on our staff at Baylor also. And so he got the job, you know, he was a, a long, he was a quarterback at Oklahoma State, a great player, you know, he played with Barry and, and uh, you know, all those great players back then that they had. And so uh, when Mike got the job, he called and said, hey, I'd like you to come here and put, put that spread offense in here. Because they had done, you know, they had done nothing but two back and Les Miles had been the, the coach there. So they were, you know, three, three, pet, three yards in a cloud of dust. And so, uh, you know, so we went in there and uh, the first year, I mean, we were absolutely terrible. I mean, I think offensively we're in the 90, 90s out of 120 schools or something like that. And we went through like four quarterbacks. And, I mean, it was just brutal. I mean, it was bad. And then, uh, you know, we got in a, a few players and and everybody bought in and understood. And I think we went to like seventh in the country in scoring the next year. And then uh, the third year we were, you know, we did it again. We were, we were in the top seven, I think, in the country. And we beat Alabama in the bowl game. And then uh, that's when I got the job at Southern Miss. Yeah, heck yeah. And now we're getting in the Southern Miss world for anybody waiting for this part of and, the and show. Let me, let me go back. Let me go back because I, I don't want to make this sound like it was all about me. It was all about players. I mean, we had players that fit the system and the system gave them opportunities and they took off and went with it. I mean, we had, you know, we had Des Bryant and Russell O'Kong and Zach Robinson at quarterback and Kendall Hunter. I mean, we just, uh, Dan Troll, I mean, we had some really good players that just took off in the system and made it great. Oh, heck yeah, coach. And uh, you, you definitely preaching to the choir of that. I just interviewed you from a quarterback at Southern Miss, Austin Davis, and he thinks the world of you, man. So trust me, he, we, we know, man, players uh, love to play for you. And then you're definitely one, one guy to glorify them, all the hard work they do. But Southern Miss time, man, you know, you always had an eye to be your head coach at, at a D1 program. And, you know, you're doing great things as an offensive coordinator for a run there. And uh, December 2007, Southern Miss decides, man, we're going to put some money together and get that great mind, uh, great attitude guy, uh, Coach Larry Fedora. How was that getting that head coaching job at Southern Miss? Well, a lot of that had to do with uh, the job that we did going, going all the way back to Florida. Uh, Jeremy Foley was the AD there, and he had worked with Richard Giannini back at Florida. And he, out of the blue, calls Richard when the job came open and said, you need to hire Larry Fedora. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure Richard knew who I was, you know, and uh, was very fortunate and blessed to work, you know, for my first AD for Richard Giannini there at uh, Southern Miss and everything that he accomplished there at that school, which was you know, unbelievable what he did. And so it was, uh, but it was a dream come true. It was, it was the opportunity to go to a place where you knew you could win. They had great history, you know, and I had been offered a head coaching job the year before and I had turned it down, a division one head, head job. And I turned it down because I wasn't sure you could win. And I didn't want my one shot to be at a place you had no chance to win. But when Southern Miss came up, I knew the history of Southern Miss. I knew about that place. I knew that people... They, they, could, they could get hard-nosed players that would work their ass off, and they knew how to win. Heck, yeah. And, and speaking of winning tradition, Coach, you know, you're coming in there replacing, you know, a legendary football coach, head coach Jeff Bauer at the time, uh, coming off of 18-year run there, Coach Bauer did, at 14 straight winning seasons. What was the vibe, you know, filling the, the shoes of Coach Bauer, man, and making a name for yourself? Yeah, I was scared to death, you know, <laughs> is uh, – you know, Pete, I mean, the, all the all the newspapers were like, uh, you know, they they let Bauer go, they're crazy, all this, and then we and then we proceed to run off. We we start out two and six. Oh know? yeah, we'll get I, to that. <laughs> yeah, you know, we start out two and six. So you know, I'm like, oh, maybe they are right, you know. But uh, no, the you know when it was tough there at the beginning, I, the players bought in. I mean, uh, Gerald McRath and Tumbo Abanaconda and those guys, and they really bought those those older guys bought in. And they, they, it didn't matter. We were, we were so close in so many games early that they, they stayed positive. And, and uh, I remember every Sunday, I mean, getting out there and just being motivated and they would, they'd get going and it was like, all right, let's go the next week. And, and uh, man, it, what a, what a great experience it was. Cause then we real, you know, reeled off all wins all the way to the end and won our bowl game that year. 
yeah, so, yeah. And that just that just kind of propelled us on into the rest of it. A- absolutely. No, the two and six start was rough for you, but man, people saw what was going to come. You had the number one recruiting class in mid majors, a five star DeAndre Brown, a wide receiver. You get, uh, I mean, the first game of the season against Lafayette, you break the school record for offense with 660 some yards or what have you. Forgot my stats right. People can see the groundwork yet you got to lay. It's a different philosophy from what was in there to everything that you're doing. And sure enough, you know, start two and six, I know, but here we come, six and six, getting to the New Orleans Bowl for a chance to keep that winning tradition going of 15 straight winning seasons. Uh, what was the intensity like heading to that New Orleans Bowl, knowing what was on the line to keep that winning streak alive? <laughs> now, really, you know, to me at that point, there was no doubt what was going to happen because the, the, we were on a roll. You know, the guys had bought in when it was tough and, and we weren't having success early on. And then, you know what, it started clicking. And we started winning. And then they they knew every all that hard work and everything they believed in was coming to fruition. And so at the bowl game, it was just a bonus on it because I, I I would have loved to have kept coaching that group for, you know, just kept going, just kept the season going. But unfortunately, the bowl game is the last game of the season. And, and it was an unbelievable game, blocking that kick in overtime to beat Troy 30 to 27 and a, a huge crowd for Southern Miss. And, and what was cool about that season, man, I hate to say you took a chance because he's so talented, but man, you decided to start a freshman quarterback in Austin Davis that season. First time Southern Miss had a freshman quarterback starting in 16 years. What made you think, you know what? I think this is my guy, this freshman. <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, he was he was talented. Okay. I mean, now maybe he didn't have the strongest arm of every of all the quarterbacks out there, but he had a chip on his shoulder. You know, he was uh he had a knack about him. He 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 knew how to win and he wanted to win and he was willing to put the team on his back to win. You know, he was a great teammate, a great leader. And uh, the, the offense really fit. I mean, he understood it. He, he figured it out. And he, he, you know, he wasn't a guy that you had to rep 50 times to get him to understand what to do. You could tell him, show it to him, show it to him on film and then go run a couple of times of practice. And he got it from that point on. And so, and there were a few concepts that he really felt really good about. And we just took off with it. And then the tempo, you know, that that was the great equalizer for us. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you were you were just doing some things that hadn't been seen in Southern Miss offensive history. You get into the 09 season, you know, we talk about like this show, anyone, anywhere, anytime, a giant killer thing. Uh, you guys get a big P5 win, man, beat Virginia. What, what's that vibe like when you're a Southern Miss? You know, you know, you can beat these guys, but, you know, in the big picture, people look, oh, Southern Miss beat Virginia. What, what's winning a game like that when you're at Southern Miss for you? Well, I remember distinctly when Richard came to me and he said, hey, we can do a, uh, you know, a two-game series with Virginia and and uh, they'll come to our place first. We'll go to their place next. And uh, I remember, I, I just remember saying, you know what, that'd be great. We'd love to do it. I said, but we want it to be an afternoon game, you know, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, you know, in, in, in uh, September, you know, uh, I mean, it was like, yeah, let's make sure it's an afternoon game. And I remember they came in with Algro and they were huge. I mean, they were pretty now. I mean, they were big. Pretty I was at the game. Guys. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just remember just thinking, you know what? I remember telling our guys, they're going to melt in the second half. And then they were they were winning the game at halftime, right? And I was like, we, hey, I'd tell them, we got them right where we want them. Damian Fletcher, all you got, we got them right where we want them, you know? And sure enough, they they ended up melting. I mean, we our guys just kept rolling. And uh, that's, a, that's a big win for the program and a big win for the players. Heck, yeah, man. And you, you guys do so well. Uh, finished seven and six that year, winning season number 16 in a row for Southern Miss. So here we go, man. The tradition's continuing. Uh, man, you're putting up crazy numbers. Another 5,000 total offense yard season for you. Uh, starting to do things that literally Southern Miss has never seen on offense. Getting into the 2010 season, and the talent's starting to really come together for you heading into this season. Uh, you guys get another big win against Virginia, man, uh, that season, and then get to, uh, um, Central Florida, excuse me, Kansas. So I had to correct myself right yeah, there, Kansas. Kansas. And then number 25, Central Florida. So you guys really making a name for yourself. Talk about some of those big wins early on in that season. Yeah, you know, Kansas, I mean, that was, uh, again, you know, our, our guy, there was no doubt. I mean, the, the players at this time, they totally bought in. They're working hard in the offseason, and they know it doesn't matter who's on the schedule. We got a chance to beat anybody we play. I mean, they believe that. You know, one, they were going to outwork everybody. And we worked them hard now. I mean, you know, we were just back uh, this past season, November, for the 10th anniversary of that uh, 2011 team. 
and we met the night before and they all talked about how hard, you know, we just, how hard we drove them. You know, they were like, yeah, you guys were brutal on us. We were like, yeah, we were. You probably can't do that anymore, you know, to guys. But they uh, they didn't know anything but hard work, you know, and and uh, they were tough and they were gritty and they were, you know, I'd like to think they were Southern Miss football players, you know, that that's kind of what the history had been of Southern Miss. And so I was proud of that fact that those guys still played like that. Uh, we didn't have the nasty bunch probably yet in uh, in eight, nine, and ten, but it came in eleven, and uh, so it was uh, it was a lot of fun coaching those guys. It really was. Heck yeah, and, and, and coach, uh, you know you love your players. I mean, they play hard for you during that 2010 season. Something horrible does happen though during the season leading up to the Houston game right after Central Florida. I mean, three of your players in an off field incident get shot. Uh, no one was killed, thank goodness. Man, what was that phone call like when you get this news of your guys in an incident like that, man, and then trying to rally the troops after well, that? You know, it was uh, first of all, you know, as you're learning to be a head coach, they don't have, they don't, there's no course on something like that, you know. And so, uh, you know, we went out to play Central Florida, and we're uh, we've we've uh, they're they're 25th or 23rd in the country, I think, at that time. 20, 25th, I believe. Polls. And uh, we go out there and beat them in an afternoon game, all right? And so we come back, and I think we were open the next week, uh, maybe, or I can't – were well, we open the next week and then I, had I, Houston? I, I think Houston was literally right after. Right so, after. But forgive me okay. if I'm wrong, but it was, it was that next so, game, though, Houston. I, I, I just remember, you know, we get back early, and uh, we got – you know, we played in an afternoon game, so you got some time a little bit in the afternoon just to relax and enjoy, and, and so – uh, I remember uh, it was about two in the morning and my, my son woke me up and he said, hey, Coach Bradford, our defensive coordinator at the time, was trying to trying to reach you. And I look at my phone and there was just all these phone calls, you know. And so I, I call him and he told me what had happened. And so immediately you get dressed and drive to the hospital and, you're, you know, you're in the emergency room and it's uh, it's just chaos. I mean, it, it was uh, it was it was really scary. You know, to have three guys uh, shot, you're worried about their lives, you're worried about their families, you're worried about the rest of your team, your rest of, you know, just the whole thing. It was, uh, it was overwhelming. It really was. But, uh, you know, we, uh, we did the best we could. Our, 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 our guys responded, uh, you know, all three of those guys healed. Uh, Martez Smith, and you know, was, is, uh, was paralyzed and, and, you know, uh, it was really tough because he was a great player on a football team. And uh, the other two played the next year in eleven, you know, which was which was pretty cool, but uh, it was a, it was a sad deal. It really was. And uh, you know, you just uh, by the grace of God, you get through it, and you uh, you lean on each other. Yeah, the leadership skills you showed during that week, keeping the team together, keeping the guys' spirits up as much as possible, man. People still talk about the great job you did right there and the leadership now, Houston, you showed. Houston had no chance that next week. No, 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 no. Even Austin said the same thing when I talked to him. So you guys rallied and, and did everything you could, man. So, but great, great coaching job right there, just just keeping the family together and, and, and doing the best you could, man. So, but yeah, you, you wind up in the season, go eight and five, get to another bowl game, man. We're now we're at number 17 straight winning season. How does it feel, you know, at that point, like, man, I'm part of this winning tradition at Southern Miss, man. My name is going to be included in all this. <laughs> well, it was more about, I was just honored to be a part of it. You know, I really was. When I got to Southern Miss, I knew the history, you know, and, and what Jeff had done there. I mean, which was amazing, uh, you know, what he did and, and, uh, you know, so to come in behind him with that kind of, you know, to to want to continue that and and just, you know, be proud of the way our players are playing. I want them to be Southern Miss style guys, and they were. And uh, I took a lot of pride in that. Heck yeah, you did. And then we're getting into the 2011 season, which people still talk about this to this day, man. One of the greatest seasons ever in Southern Miss football. A lot of hype going into that season. You had the talent in place going into that season. We'll, did you know you were going to be good or like, is no, it, this is going to be a I knew we were going to be good. <laughs> it, it, it was all falling into place. You know, we find that, that recruiting class, those guys that we you talked about when we got in there, they were seniors now. Uh, you know, it was all coming together at the right time. Our schedule was good. You know, we, we had Virginia on the, on the schedule going to their place. You know, we went to Navy at Annapolis. I mean, and, and had to go some tough places. And uh, I, I felt really good about our football team going into that season. I knew if we could stay healthy, we, we had a chance to be pretty good. Oh, heck yeah. And you got another P5 win there against Virginia, man. That's a, your third one while you're there. 
And the Navy game I do want to talk about because I talked to Austin about that too, man. He put up a 237 quarterback rating. You guys score 63 points against Navy. When things click like that on offense, man, is it just like you're in the zone as a coach? Right? How's he? Well, you got, you know, first of all, you got to, so I had history with Navy when I was at Air Force right. and they ran the same, they ran the same style of offense as, as Air Force did. So I was scared to death for our defense, you know, so we, we, we talked about, you know, Hey, the game's going to get shortened down. We're probably only going to get about nine series, you know, because the way they're going to eat the clock and they'll make it tough on your defense. And so we got to do it. And I was on our offense. We got to score every series, every series we got to score. And, uh, you know, I, I think probably the thing, the tempo got them and they had no, they, they, they just couldn't handle it. I remember Kenny called me after that game the next week and said, Hey, I'd like to talk to you about tempo because we just, y'all kill us with it. And so it was, uh, I mean, they, they were good offensively. They really was. They scored some points on a really good defense because of the triple option, but they, they couldn't slow us down. I mean, we were, we were hitting on all cylinders in that game offensively. Heck yeah, coach. And y'all are rolling, rolling along with the season. I mean, you're nine and one, number 22 in the nation. And then, man, a tough game. I hate to bring it up, but at UAB, you know, uh, the Sugar Bowl was on the line and things. It's man. part of it. Oh, man, I got to tell the story. Uh, how'd you handle that loss? How'd the team, because that was a rough one. Cost, cost the but Sugar you know, Bowl. You know, it's funny. When, when we were at the reunion, the guys, you know, they're all, hey, our offense was best. No, our defense was the best, you know. And it's like, all right, coach, settle it. Who, who was best? I'm like, okay, well. You know, we go to Marshall the first game of the season, and we're uh, we we turn the ball over five times, and and we lose a game. You know, and had a chance in the last series to win it, and uh, so offensively we we didn't do very good in that game. I said, then we go to UAB, you know, late in the season, and uh, they score thirty four points on us against a great defense, and so our defense didn't do a very good job. So I could settle the argument with our players that way, but uh, yeah, it was devastating. It was a Thursday night. Uh, you could actually. Pulled the uh, press box windows up and yelled the plays down because all there was was crickets out there. I mean, there was nobody at the game, you know, and it was about the the worst atmosphere you could possibly have. And I, I mean, I'm going to put it on me because I did a poor job of preparing our guys for that type of atmosphere, and we played like it. We we were just slept walk through the game. It was it was disappointing. It really was, you know. And so because we were a much better football team than that, and it just goes to show you, you know, you better prepare the same every single week and if you don't you get your butt kicked yeah but coach you bounce back after this game and then and, and just make some positive things happen that definitely people are still talking about a lot finishing the top 25 win the cusa east division you head to the conference usa championship game to play undefeated houston on abc for the conference usa championship and it's not every day southern miss is on abc man and i was in my living room had my popcorn I was fired up, ready to go at a house party, and you guys put on a show, man. Did you know you guys were going to do that in Houston or what? <laughs> well, I can tell you when I when I did know, I, I'll tell you when I knew, I mean, because it hit me. I mean, we uh, I mean, great week of practice. Our guys are ready. We're still working the tar out of them. I remember Paul Jackson, our strength coach, who did a tremendous job that year. If a guy was late to a, 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 a early morning lift, They'd all, they'd go out on the field and they would do, you know, over and backs and up downs. And, you know, and I remember it was like a, a Tuesday morning and I get into the office and I hear the whistle and it's dark out there on the field. I can't see, you know, my feet, you know, but I hear the whistle and I hear, you know, I'm like, okay. So we go into staff meeting later in the morning. I said, Paul, what happened? He goes, one of the guys was late. I was like, Paul, you know, we we're playing for the, the conference championship this week. He was like, don't matter coach, you know? When guy was late, so we 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 did what we do. I was like, all right, and so, but our guys worked hard. We went to the game, and I remember it was Friday night. We always went to a movie on Friday night to relax the guys, and uh, we get out of the movie and we get on the bus and we're heading back to the hotel. And the buses had, you know, they got ESPN going right, and we're everybody's quiet on the bus, nobody's talking, and uh, you know, everybody's serious and they're watching ESPN and it's it's Championship Saturday, right? They're talking about it, and they've got every conference and they've got you know, the logos of both teams, and they talk about each team, right? And Conference USA was the next one up, and they start talking about Houston, right? And Case Keenum and the number one offense in the country, and they're scoring 50 points a game, and they're undefeated, and they're number six in the country. And, I mean, they're going on and on. And then when it's time to talk about Southern Miss, it just goes to commercial, and that was it. They never said a word. And I remember I'm sitting in the front seat of the bus, and I'm thinking, wow. And all of a sudden, 
one of our linebackers stands up in the back of the bus and he starts hollering and screaming. He is so pissed off and they all start hollering. And I never turned around. And it was at that moment I knew we were going to play well. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to say a word. It was already done on Friday night. And then we played like that on Saturday. You know, it was uh, phenomenal. No, it was a huge moment for us, man. It's one of the best games ever in Southern Miss history. So congratulations to that. It was so cool, man. They made a bobblehead of Austin Davis holding up that trophy, man. So I even got one in my son's room. So we got a big deal, memorable night. So you get a chance to go to a bowl, man. You got two options, it seems like. Play Penn State in Dallas or go to Hawaii and play Nevada. Can I ask you why you guys decided to go to, go to Hawaii? Well, we couldn't go to the Liberty Bowl, right? It was the first, it was the one time in, yeah. the, in the Liberty Bowl contract that they could take somebody from the SEC. And I, I can't remember who they took, but we weren't going as the champions. And so our guys were disappointed about that. And then it was, okay, we can go to Dallas or we can go to Hawaii. And I'm, you know, we're, we talk about it as a staff and we knew probably 90% of the players on our team would never have the opportunity to ever go to Hawaii in their life. And for me, the bowl game at this point in the season or in this season was about these players. What was going to be the best experience for them, right? And so we decided to go to – and Richard Giannini allowed me to make that decision. And so we made the decision to go to Hawaii, and those guys will tell you from that reunion, that was the best experience they've ever had in their life. I mean, it was just unbelievable. They got to do things that they had never thought they would ever do in their life. And so to this day – if I had to do it again, I would do the exact same thing. I really would. And we went out there and had a great game and won the game, and, and uh, they had fun. Heck, yeah, finished 12-2, and two, only the third time in Southern Miss history. We had double-digit wins in the season, finished top 20. Uh, and, and by the time you're done at Southern Miss, man, your four years, the most prolific four years of offense in the history of Southern Miss football. I mean, your last season, over 6,000 yards of offense, man. So with that said, you're getting recognized, man. They're like, look at this Coach Fedora guy. we got to get him on board. And, and a bigger job at North Carolina pops up. Uh, was it bittersweet to leave Southern Miss? Or what was that vibe, you know, leaving? Because you, you made a, a I mean, huge impact in Hattiesburg, man. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you what. It was the hardest decision I ever made in my life, even though it was going to triple my salary. You know, it, it was going to be, uh, you know, life-changing for my family. But – it was by far the hardest thing I had to do. I, I shed tears over making that decision, you know, and uh, leaving those guys. I remember walking into that room and, and telling them, and, and a lot of tears were shed, and, and it, was, it was hard. It was the hardest decision I, I ever had, you know, and, and Richard did everything he could to keep me, you know. Uh, he really did, and, and I appreciated that, but it was just uh, – it was the right decision for me at that time, and, and uh, I, I had to do it. You know, real quick question, too, about Hattiesburg, man. I, I know it's hard to leave, but what a tremendous opportunity in North Carolina. Just real quick for the fans, man, what were some of your favorite things about Hattiesburg? Just the Southern Miss campus, what have you, man? The, the, the maybe... passion of the people. The uh, passion of the people. They, I mean, you, you know, you're at, a, at a, a, uh, a group of five school, but we had a following. We had Southern Mississippi believed in us. Yeah, you had your Ole Miss and your, your Mississippi State people. But we had a following, and they believed in Southern Miss. And it was blue-collar, hard-nosed, get-after-people's-ass type people. And they were passionate about football because of the history, you know. And so it was, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was in Hattiesburg uh, two weekends ago, went going back for a wedding of a friend uh, whose daughter they got married. And so we, we, we go back there quite a bit, actually. I, I, we love that place, and it's always about the people. It always is. There's a lot of good people there. Well, oh, heck yeah, man. That's awesome to hear that because I know you're still beloved around there, man. And But, you know, what an opportunity to go to North Carolina. And uh, how was that, you know, jumping into the kind of what they call the Power Five conferences as a head coach, uh, uh, just a, a big job like North Carolina? Well, I mean, it was – we did things the same way we did them at Southern Miss. We didn't change the way we did things because we were doing things the right way when we were at Southern Miss. We were coming into a, a very difficult situation because uh, – they had just went on, uh, you know, NCAA probation from Butch Davis' staff, and uh, uh, we restricted on the amount of scholarships we could give for about the first three years. So it was, uh, it was tough. It really was. But you know, you make the best of it. You stay positive, and and uh, 
you know, I think in our four season there, we won the uh, the league and, you know, in our division and played Clemson for the championship. And, uh, you know, and I think they won the national championship that year. And we, we took them right down to the end in that game. So it was, yeah, a, Coach, it was a great experience, really was. Great kids, uh, great people in that area also. Heck yeah, Coach. I mean, those first two years, you, you have winning seasons two of the first three years you're there. And then that fourth year, yeah, you turn it on, man. Number 15 in the nation, 11 and three, playing for the ACC championship. Uh, what do you attribute that year four, man, that success finally, here we go, uh, to uh, just, just hardworking players or hardworking coaches? <laughs> well, both, actually. I mean, you got you got a staff that, you know, the majority of the staff went with me, and so they knew what we needed to do. They knew it was going to take time, knew it wasn't going to happen overnight. Now, the first year, we actually won the division also in 12. You know, it's just that we were ineligible to go because of the uh, NCAA rules. And so, uh, but... Again, those players bought in there. They bought in. They worked hard. You know, we had, uh, you know, in, in 14, it was really the toughest year. And at the end of that season, we kind of made some changes and did some things differently. And, uh, you know, then started rolling for after that and, and had a lot of fun in 15 and 16. And, you know, so it was, a, you know, again, it's always about the players. I mean, you got guys that go in and they bust their ass and they work hard for you. And uh, they believe in what they're doing and you do things the right way. Yeah, and, and, and at that point in 2015, you're a big name in college football. You're up for national coach of the year that year. So doing some really awesome things. And I know the last few years in North Carolina, it didn't quite go according to plan. But, uh, you know, coach, one thing about you, people know where they stand with you. And that's why people respect you and admire you, man. You speak your mind. And there's been a lot of changes in college football. There has, you know, just rule changes here and there, what, what have you. Uh, in 2018, you talked about, you know, you might not recognize the game in 10 years just with all these changes and, and things. You remember so, that, huh? uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. yeah what, and, what I, I, and, and I got I got blistered now. I know. I, you know, I mean, I got blistered for it. But, you know, coach, you know, but, but the thing is, that's why people respect you. Speak your mind, man. And, and, you know, the game is changing a lot, though. What are your thoughts maybe now on the future of college football and just where things are headed, you know, just the changes? <laughs> yeah, I, I I mean, it's part of why I'm retired. I mean, because I I, I don't believe in a lot of things that are going on right now in college football. And and uh, I, I don't I don't know what the answer is. I, I know that it's gotten way out of hand. Uh, NIL and the transfer portal. I, I'm not saying that the players don't deserve something, right? I, I, I believe that. I, I do. But right now, it's just totally out of hand. There's no, you know, it, it, there's no restrictions on it. There's no regulation. There, It's just, it, it's the wild, wild west right now. I mean, you got guys that are going in and negotiating contracts so that they, to stay at their school, they're one each year, it's it's like free agency. You know, it's in a, it's free agency in the NFL. It's in college football, but it's every year you're a free agent, and you can go negotiate how much you want to make and and move on to the next school. And I, if that's what people want for college football, that's what they've got. I don't believe that's really what the mass majority wants because the college football game, I'm I'm going to say, was probably the best sport there was in all of the United States. And some people are going to argue and say pro football is number one. Well, if they're saying that's, you know, college football was number two. It was pretty dang good. And now we've gone and we've, 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 got, we've got politics and politicians involved in the game now. And you see where that's taking it. It screwed it all up. No, Coach, I mean, I got to admit, I'm, I'm a diehard Southern Miss fan. Anybody watching this knows this. And uh, we have Frank Gore Jr. on our team, and he broke the FBS bowl record with 329 yards in the, yeah, the most recent that. bowl. And unfortunately, my brain is immediately like, God, can we keep him? Is he going to go yeah. somewhere else? You know, and things like that. But he did one of the coolest things, man. I don't know if you saw right after the game, he expressed his loyalty to Southern Miss. I'm staying here. But unfortunately, your brain does have to go there when you're fans sure. of certain teams and you got these great players, man. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I, I'm not blaming but because the player, I mean, if you're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old and you have the opportunity to make some make this money that some of these guys are making out there right now, hey, I, I can't blame them for that. I mean, it, it, it's – but I'm just not sure that unregulated, the way it's going right now is the way they really want college football to be. I really don't. Because you're going to have probably uh, 10 Power 5 schools that are going to accumulate all the talent. You know, because they got all the money, you know, and so it's going to it's going to make it really tough. It's going to make it really tough for a Southern Miss. It really is. Oh, no doubt about it. The, the landscape's so interesting. And, and 
thanks for talking about that because it's a hot topic every yeah. time I talk college football. There, well, so. I, I saw Will. I saw Will at the wedding. You know, and we talked about that. How Coach hard Hall, it is. Hall, yep. Coach yeah, Hall, yep. we saw. We were talking about how hard it is on him right now just to maintain some continuity within your team. You know, because you're you're constantly recruiting the guys that are on your team. You know, and and the thing that people don't talk about is if if every team now is taking say 10 transfers, well, that's 10 scholarships that aren't being given to high school players. So all these high school players, there a lot fewer high school players are getting scholarships to go, you know, play college ball. Mm. And, you know, nobody's really talking about that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there, no, stuff like that, man. There's so many topics to hit on with it. Uh, but but thanks for the hot takes there with uh, the transfer portal and things going on nowadays in college football. So after North Carolina, man, you go to Texas uh, to coach some, go to Baylor as offensive coordinator. But it, like you just said, it seems like maybe the college game in the same for me. Well, in the meantime, there in 2022, the USFL decides to start back up. And you're a big name. And I'm a New Orleans guy, man. I grew up with the New Orleans Breakers and, and all that crew. So I'm like, look who they hired for their first team to be the GM and the head coach, Larry Fedora, man. I was like, yeah, sweet. And uh, so how was that, man, just that, that year in New Orleans with the USFL and the New Orleans Breakers? Yeah, that that uh, again, it was a quite of an experience. I mean, I I, I enjoyed it. Love the players, the coaches, the whole thing. Now, putting together an entire league from scratch, I mean, was was difficult. And I mean, there was all kind of logistical problems within that. You had all eight teams staying in Birmingham, all eight coaching staffs, all staying at the same hotel. You're splitting up practice facilities. So you're you're sharing a practice facility with two teams. You're sharing meeting rooms with two teams. So there's all kind of logistical nightmares in that first year, which made it really, really difficult. But you know what? Again, it's about the players, the coaches that you're coaching with. It's just football. You didn't have to worry about NIL. You didn't have to worry about the transfer portal. You didn't have to worry about any of that. There were no recruiting calls every single night. It was just straight ball. And again, you got guys that buy in, and we had a lot of fun. We really did. Oh, heck yeah. You had a successful year one, but unfortunately, it was just year one for you, man. You decided uh, not to come back to the USFL, but, you know, it's just business moves. You got to do what you got to well, do. Well, it, uh, it was the really, you know, if, you know, if we weren't going back to Birmingham, I probably would have stayed in it. But Birmingham, you know, it was four hours or, or excuse me, a lot farther than four hours uh, from where I live now. So it was, you know, halfway across the country from my wife. And, uh, you know, for four months. And that was, uh, you know, I just, at this age and where we are in life, uh, you know, we're empty nesters and and uh, we can enjoy life. And so I was like, you know what? I think the USFL is going to be successful. I think it's a great league for players that are just on the bubble of the NFL. So it gives them an opportunity to keep playing and keep chasing their dream. And it's a great opportunity for coaches that are just, you know, in between jobs or, or whatever. I mean, or maybe they're retired and they want to just keep coaching for four months, you know, because it wasn't year round. So it was a, I mean, I think it's a great, great situation. It's just, it's not right for me at this time in my life. Fully respect that coach. And I guess we'll get to now and uh, what you're up to now. I mean, everybody knows you have an awesome family life, man. So maybe some updates in, in the life and family of uh, Coach Fedora. Well, I'm, I've got a, a son who graduated from Southern Miss who uh, played ball there and uh, went on, and he is a, a sports agent in Austin, Texas. He works for Bus Cook, who's right there out of Hattiesburg. And, oh, yeah. uh, and then, uh, so then I've got a daughter who is a, uh, she's 28. She's living in uh, Nashville. She graduated from the University of Texas, and she is an esthetician there and doing really well in Nashville and loves it. And then I've got another daughter who's uh, 24. And she is uh, an elementary school teacher in Austin, Texas. She graduated from the University of North Carolina. And then we've got our youngest daughter, who's 21, who's uh, she is a junior in Tuscaloosa at the University of Alabama. And so what we do is go see our kids. Uh, we just went to Parents Weekend a couple weeks ago uh, in uh, Tuscaloosa and had a lot of fun with her. And, and we, uh, we're traveling. We're seeing friends. Uh, you know, playing some golf and, uh, you know, working on, I bought a ranch and working on the ranch. Oh man, what a fantastic life right there. And great job, dad, with all the updates with the kids, man. So good work. Uh, and, and, you know, recapping your career, what an awesome head coaching career, coaching career, uh, great job at Southern Miss, you know, you're highly thought of in that world. 
what's some words you might have for the Southern Miss Nation uh, right about now and uh, just about your time there? Yeah, well, first of all, our, our time was really special. I mean, uh, you know, we there's a reason my wife and I go back there all the time. I mean, we we do. I mean, playing the member guests every every summer at the end of the summer every year, and love going back to Hattiesburg Country Club and playing with and seeing friends and seeing people and just having a good time. You know, uh, that that experience was really special. It really was, and we were around good people, hardworking people that were a lot of fun. And uh, you know, I think I tell people all the time, Mississippi gets a bad rap. You know, people think that Mississippi is uh, is not a good state. And I'm like, maybe that's the way Mississippi people want it, you know, because they don't want you moving there because it's a it's a wonderful way of life. It really is. It's a it's a great place. And we loved every bit of it and, uh, you know, loved all the players that we had. And, you know, you brought up Austin Davis, but there's so many more. I mean, from from DeAndre to, to Lampley. And, you know, I saw a bunch of those guys and they're all coaching in the state now, you know, which is, is really fun to see them doing well. You know, and and uh, so that that you know, it's it's just a special place in our heart. You know, and and I will say this to the fans, Will Hall is going to get it done. He's going to get it done. Just back him and and stay behind him because you got to remember it was rough when we started. You know what? And and things are different right now. And uh, but he's got the passion for it. He's a he's a Mississippi guy. He he believes in it. He he's going to get it done. I I really believe that. Oh, you heard that Southern Miss Nation from Coach Fedor. I believe in Will Hall, too, too, and everything they're doing year three this year. So we'll see what happens. Now, Coach, since you're not coaching anymore, you don't have a loyalty to any specific program. I always end my show with a little slogan you might be familiar with if you don't mind joining me. As always, with Coach Fedora, it's Southern Miss. To the top. To the top. Yes, You got sir. it, baby. To the top. <laughs> Well, it's such a great time catching up with former Southern Miss head football coach Larry Fedora right there. Well, next up comes a story from someone who was on Coach Fedora's teams. It's former fullback Bruce Johnson. And if you know me from my football playing days, you know I had this big old neck roll that I used to wear. And uh, what I loved about Bruce Johnson, the fullback from back then, uh, he wore this butterfly restrictor that was huge as well. So his neck was definitely protected, which I always like. So with all that said, here comes a great story from that time frame with Coach Fedora with Bruce Johnson. Golden Eagle Nation, it's Bruce Johnson, fullback for the 2009 to 2013 Golden Eagle football teams. Thank you, Marshawn Kenny, for giving me the opportunity to share my most memorable moments at Southern Miss. Let's just jump right into it. It's all about 2011. Uh, you know, coming off two really rough years as far as uh, meeting our potential. Solid years, but we knew there was something missing in 2009 and 2010. And uh, we got in the weight room, we got in the film room, we put together an incredible staff, an incredible team. It was wins like on the road at, at Navy and Virginia, uh, ECU, where we cleared out the stadium by halftime. And uh, it was all about they don't know, baby, and it's not their fault. Um, you know, I also think it's losses like Marshall and it's losses like UAB on a Thursday night that set us up for an incredible uh, UCF game, came down to two conference rivals. We won by one. Danny Ratman was on fire. Nine people touched the ball, had a freshman score a touchdown. I scored a touchdown. Then you know something's crazy. And uh, But it was P26. Austin Davis rolls out to the right, hits me in the flats. The rest is history, baby. So um, an incredible journey. Just so thankful for the staff, Coach Fedora, and what he instilled in us, choking adversity out right when you see it. Uh, we relay that to life all the time. And uh, just super thankful for you know all the memories we had. And we get to celebrate that every five years when we go back for conference championship reunions for the 2011 team. So uh, appreciate you guys having me. And Southern Miss, to the top. Thank you so much for sending that story into the show, Bruce Johnson. Well, that's it for another edition of Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime. And if you're watching this on YouTube right now, we are on a push for a thousand subscribers there. Uh, like I said in the commercial not too long ago, we're limited to what we can do on YouTube until we get a thousand plus subscribers and really get this Southern Miss uh, message out there. So please assist over there at YouTube. It'll take a second out of your day. It's free and hit that subscribe button. And if you're listening on Apple uh, Podcasts or Spotify, please subscribe over there as well. Well, until next time, as always, it's Southern Miss to the top.